ways. Hallelujah. So today we're going to lift up the name of the Lord and say, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing it again. You give life. You are love. You bring Yeah. 
God for that. Amen. Welcome, Bazalane. It's good to see you here. Amen. You're looking good. Look at your neighbor and say, you look good today. Tell them that their service is for you. Amen. Amen. Uh, there's power. Um, yes, that being said, um, it's that time, you know, uh, we want to know who come among us is visiting living oracles for the very first time. Could you just born or just gonna be bold enough and just raise your hands and say, I am among them that came for the first time to, to experience this local house. But I'm among them. Jesus, we thank you, my brother. We thank you, our sister. Jesus, show them some love. Amen. Show them some love. They wanna come again. Hug them to come again, Basalani. Hug them in such a way that they're gonna come back. Amen. Jesus. Born um, we Natav will give us an awesome, wonderful song at this moment. And we'll welcome one another, greet one another, Jesus. We're going to greet one another prophetically, Jesus. So I want, with those holy kisses, the holy air body, but everything holy in the house of God. We want to use every strategy, a holy high five. We want, Jesus, Natav, can you just grace us and we'll welcome one another in this wonderful atmosphere. Amen. Hey. Hallelujah. Can you send us on high, high, high? Hallelujah, high.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Nataf. Jesus, there's power. Uh, we have come to that uh, wonderful time of the service again. It's another segment. I get they build up. Wabo. Building ourselves up in the Holy Ghost. Wabo. So, Vasalane, we are led by this awesome team in the house. You know, they are the most born, they are the most one of a kind team you'll find, even in any church. Amen. It is a team where I'm from. Wabo. It's the team from which I belong. They are called Shibole. Amen. But we are the prophetic and the revival team of the house. Hallelujah. And Bona, 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 God is doing fireworks in there. You know, uh, uh, we're going to have a prelude, you know, from a wonderful sister of ours, Bariki CCD. I would like you to just grace her by clapping hands for her so that she can come and give us an awesome word from the Lord. Come on, she carries a burden for our generation, Bazalan. Metalem Mato, Jesus. Flow, woman of God. Oh, wow. Hallelujah. Amen. I greet you all in the mighty and the forming of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. My name is Mamu Sirika Apu. I'm from Shibolet. Amen. I greet Baruti, Mamu Ruti. I'm going to pray for me to come down. Amen. Father, in the mighty, wonderful name of Christ Jesus, we honor you and we lift up your name. We glorify you and we seek after no other. We seek after you, Lord. And this evening, this weekend, oh God, we say pour of yourself, oh God, upon us. Pour upon us. Pour upon us, O oh God, yourself, that we may be sanctified, Lord, that we may follow you wholeheartedly, Lord, in the mighty, wonderful name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, Ezekiel 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river, by the river of Sheba, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So there are, no, there's one thing that the Lord is emphasizing about this weekend. Um, and is that we have come to a river. We are by the river. Um, there are waters, they are stayed and they are ready for us. Amen. Genesis 2, from verse 8, it speaks about um, the river that flows in Eden. So this river flows in Eden and it flows into the, the garden of Eden. But then it divides into four rivers. So the Lord is emphasizing that every man that will stand in front of us this weekend, it's just like that river. It's a grace that is coming, and it's coming to pour. It's coming to water the garden. And, it, and, and the grace that is in them will be divided among us. So the Lord emphasizes that we may be mindful. It is not a weekend that is about feelings um, or the physical. It is not about what you felt when they sang that song or what you did not feel when the preacher preached. It's all about receiving from the Lord. Amen. Um, I'm going to try to explain it, um, um, relating it to this vision that I had. Um, about two weeks or three weeks ago, um, we were having revival Wednesday as she was left, and I saw a door open in the heavens. And there were waters, there were waters flowing out of that door. And there came a man, this man, this man comes out and he's confident. I cannot explain the feeling, but I can only explain it by giving you the scenario. You know how it feels after you, you have written a test and you know you've passed. And you walk out, you know you've passed. You know you've accomplished it. So that man had that confidence. So the Lord is emphasizing that, that this man, a man of the throne, of the throne room, who live in the throne room. And the Bible says there's a river flowing from there. 
The Bible says it is the throne of grace. So there are graces, graces flowing through them. There are portals that they have opened. There are, there are doors that they've opened, uh, mysteries that they, they have um, entered in, you know, um, things of ages, mentors that they carry. And that will come through them. And that is what the Lord is emphasizing. And to qualify that, um, I'm going to read Ephesians 4, verse 29. It says, let no, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So they are coming to speak good things. Good things will proceed from them. And these are the things from the throne. Hallelujah. And as they minister, like it says, they will, to, to the hearers, they will be ministering grace. Hallelujah. That word, when you take it, it also, okay, in New King James Version, it says they will impart, it says it, it imparts grace. So they will impart, they will give grace. Hallelujah. Um, yeah, Jeremiah, um, okay, that is also to qualify um, what I've just said. Jeremiah 10 verse 11, it says, when he utters his voice, there is a multitude of water in the heavens. Psalm 29 verse 3, it says, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. Again, they know the voice. They walk with the voice. And we are here to receive from them. We are here to receive from them. So I urge you that you may listen. You may listen. And in your hearing, you will receive. I urge you that you may have a posture of honor. That don't find yourself saying, Maruti preaches every Sunday, I know. Don't say that. He's in the program because there's something that flows through him. I am from Shiboleth and I flow like that. Amen. Come on now. Hallelujah. Um, that is so awesome. Amen. 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 Um, it is a, it is an utterance that comes with a burden, amen. amen. Yeah, and uh, we thank the Lord for that, amen. Uh, we are a prophetic house, Father Lord. We are activated to flow like that and just minister grace, you know, to our city and our generation, amen. Um, it is that time for announcements. Um, it's just a few announcements, Father Lord. Prophetic conference announcements. <laughs> we've got our services um, tomorrow at 10. We've got our, our prophetic school. So I hope that you have registered and born ready to receive your awesome, awesome, awesome word from you know our own trainer and facilitator. Amen. Muruti is good. Amen. Um, our afternoon service starts at... Um, Six o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I will sort about that four o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. Amen. Come ready. And it's just going to be an awesome, awesome time in the Lord. Amen. And then we've also got our Sunday services as well. Our Sunday service starts 10 a.m. sharp, you know. Um, and it's going to be awesome. And then we're going to have around two wabo, from that service. We're gonna, you know, our Sunday service is placidity. Wabo. We're going to have around two. Around two. We're going to start at 4 o'clock as well. And it's just going to be an awesome, awesome atmosphere. Amen. So, uh, we're going to welcome our very own. He's the in thing. He's the powerful thing. He's the next thing. He is the current thing in our generation. Jesus. Why we go to fest at the apostles. Jesus. He's the trailblazer of our time. He's our own Black Panther. Akata. Jesus. Hey. Jesus, there's too much power. 
in that man. I'd wanna bend. Jesus, can you please welcome, you know, my very own apostle and my pastor, Apostle Cedar Peterson. Show him some love. Show him some love. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, Zion. Amen. You can do much better than that. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, you can do much better than that. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, someone give Jesus praise. Amen. Come on, someone give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Um, Welcome everyone to Living Oracles Tabernacle, an apostolic and prophetic New Testament church. Um, welcome to all our first time visitors. Welcome to all our regular visitors. Welcome to the church at large. Welcome to our distinguished pastors in front. Um, a special welcome to my father in the faith, Apostle Gabelo. A special welcome. Uh, to Apostle Muzingu and I can appreciate him as well, amen. Can you also honor our esteemed guest today, our Prophet Sean, can you also honor him? Can you also honor Muruti Ediha Debe, hallelujah. He's a humble battle ex, amen. Uh, uh, I want us to, can you appreciate my lovely wife? Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I can feel, man, something's missing. You know, man, there was something missing from that. Um, so I'd like us to receive an offering. I'd like us to receive an offering tonight. Uh, let's open up our Bibles. Proverbs 21. In fact, can I get my board there? I think I want my board. Uh, behind your seat, there are some QR codes. You can just scan it and you'll be able to, to give uh, just behind your seat. Those of you in front, um, on the screen, with Shambhaleka, with Hallelujah. You know, sometimes people think uh, what's next to them in church is their blessing. You know, um, so someone came and blessed themselves with our monitors. So keep your phone close by, you know. Someone might think it's their blessing. <laughs> it's the answer to their prayer. Love her in basket, and I got some ease. I'm going to go to the house. God is answering my prayer. So, um, yeah, those are the, just the giving methods. You can just um, quickly scan, and you'll be able to give. Um, at the back, there's a lady there um, with a funky hairstyle on one. This is the Toby Ile. Uh, she has our speed point if you wanna swipe or if you wanna tap. Uh, you can go and see her. And they're gonna come with offering baskets uh, right here in front. Um, I don't know if there are other pastors whom we have not acknowledged um, We honor you. We acknowledge you. Uh, yeah, forgive us for this lip up. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to. Uh, let's open our Bibles. The book of Proverbs. Marahona Mark.
Where's that high quality one? The one I use. Just want to show you guys something quickly. I hope everyone can see. Now this is an imperative thing I want to remind us of. But I want us to read a few verses called Proverbs. Proverbs 21, verse 20. Listen to what he says. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The wise store up choice food and olive oil. But fools gulp theirs down. The Bible has a lot to say about financial administration. The Bible has a lot to say about our money and how we use it. The Bible has so much to say on this matter. But unfortunately, it is the last source of information that we visit when it comes to financial matters. It is the last thing we visit when it comes to financial matters. But we expect biblical results when it comes to our money. This verse is simply trying, us, simply trying to tell us one thing. That is very easy to blow it. It's very easy to blow it. Because there is a mindset we have a very wrong mindset. The Bible tells us, ne, or rather we learn, there are two primary emotions connected to money. Two primary emotions connected to money. And this is how mammon operates and manifests himself when it comes to money. I need you to be sober and to pay attention. Two emotions greed and fear. Investigate your financial decisions. Investigate them. They're either motivated by greed or they're motivated by fear. Once we can master just these two emotions, mammon loses its grip on us. And one of the very active ways to loosen mammon's grip is to let go of money. When you let go of it, mammon loses his grip on you. Because greed will tell you, get more. Fear will tell you, there is scarcity tomorrow. These are the two emotions connected with money. Even in your business decisions, Look at this verse in the Living Bible. The Living Bible says, same verse, the wise person saves for the future. The wise person saves for the future. But the foolish person spends whatever they get. Every little money that my enjoyment. Whatever they get, they spend it. There is a generation of people who believe money is meant to be spent. You must just spend. If you are not spending, something is wrong. So I want us to consider that even as we participate in, in financial activities, God gave us the principle and it is not a law, but it's a very powerful principle if we can use it. The tithing. Why am I talking about tithing? Tithe is a great equalizer. It is a great equalizer when it comes to giving. It's a great equalizer. 
tithe their one million and tithe their ten thousand are the same. He tithe. He ten percent. Proportionately, it is equal. It is the greatest equalizer. There is a principle we learn from Jesus. We learn this principle from Jesus. One day, Jesus stands over the offering basket and he begins to compare the offerings. And he says, who gave more? But Jesus is not looking at how much went into the basket. Jesus is looking at how much remained in their purse. He said in your heart that Jesus looked at how much remained in their purse. And by looking at how much remained, he said, who gave more? Today, you'll find wise people like Cyril, know it all like Cyril, who will tell you that it's irresponsible to give God your last. Smart people like Cyril, it's irresponsible. Don't give God your last. But funny enough, Jesus, you know, say, hey, lady, that is the last thing you have. That's the last thing you have. What are you going to eat tomorrow? He gladly received it. Here's what I want my generation to know. God accepts sacrifice. God still accepts sacrifice. He still does. It was the last thing. Smart people like me will be like, oh, what are you going to eat tomorrow? That's what I was going to say. And then tomorrow? But God is not concerned about tomorrow. He gladly receives it. We see a woman who is a widow. This widow woman, she's just gathering up some sticks. She's going to prepare the final meal. You know that meal before you fast, like the last meal. She's, she's preparing that meal that my son and I are going to eat and die. The Lord says, Elijah, at that last meal, you must eat it first. How greedy of Elijah. How stubborn of Elijah. How dare you, Elijah. Greed of fear. He's saying that. How dare you. The greed will be, how dare you. That's all for me. The fearful will say, what will I eat tomorrow? But God gladly receives. There was a time Jesus goes to Peter. After this encounter. And we see that um, Peter's calling was birth in the miracle. It was birth in the miraculous. And after this miracle, away from me, Lord. I'm a sinner. Away from me, Lord. I am unclean. And this is from now on, I will make you Fishers of men. Follow me. And the Bible says they left everything. Jesus did not give them a salary advice. Jesus didn't tell them this how much should be earning. The Bible says they left everything to follow him. Peter is married. He said, okay, now what about your wife? What about your kids? Uh, financial prudence. Just follow me. And they followed him. I'm saying there is a place in God where God accepts and honors sacrifice. Amen. And why am I giving you this perspective? Because no sacrifice is comfortable to make. No sacrifice is pleasing to make. Listen, Satan will never lead you into sowing into the kingdom. He will preach powerful sermons. He will preach very powerful sermons to you. Why? You should not. Now, I want our minds to be renewed. I want our minds to be refreshed when it comes to this issue and this concept of money. Do you know that in the entire New Testament, there is no subject that Jesus rebukes and gives wisdom and clarity and warnings 
concerning more than money. If you were to add up all of the verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you add them all up and take the average, one in every four verses speaks about money. One in every four. To a point, Jesus makes a parallel between himself and mammon. He makes that parallel. God or mammon. No wonder the two things God touches when he wants to grow our faith are these money and food. Finance and food. What grows your faith? Fasting. What grows your faith? Giving. These are the two areas. Why do you think the apostles were so bold to move in the miraculous? It's because they let everything go. They forgot about everything. It did something to them. They have learned to trust in God. Listen, if you lose money today, if you lose a job, the first thing which will come to your mind, what are my children going to eat? Food. And to challenge and grow our faith, God says, put your plate upside down. Your doctor will tell you you need to eat. God will say, put it upside down. Listen, God gave us something to grow our faith. Number one. Number two, to deal with unbelief. You're fasting. But I come here on. There is a divine wisdom when it comes to, to finance. It'll come and buy without money. Come and buy without money. Come and buy without having enough. I wrote something. Proverbs. Ah, let me leave it. Our problem, ne, we spend more money than we make. You see, as a generation, our problem is that we are spending more than we make. Listen to what the Bible says. And we're going to receive an offering. Can they come up here with the offering basket? Can they come up here with the offering baskets? I know it's a bucket, don't. With a horse pipe in J. I'm like that, then I can not even Are they ready? Okay, so um, these are our two offering baskets where we're going to throw in our seeds. I want to leave you with this thought. I want to leave you with this thought. The Bible says two things. The greatest among you will be your servant. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says for as long... Yeah, you can remove it. Ne? Thank you. I was going to blow your mind. but I was going to blow your mind, but it's fine. The greatest among you shall be your servant, number one. Number two, the Bible tells us that for as long as the earth remains, deep time and harvest, summer and winter, you know the verse, shall remain as long as the earth remains. What does this mean? It's a perpetual thing. What does this mean? It simply means Seed, time, harvest. Seed, time, harvest. Seed, time, harvest. Seed, time, harvest. Sowing and reaping. How does it work today? Here is an iPhone 
14 Pro Max. Or give 15 Pro Max. Whatever. 82,000 rands. That, can, that phone can buy a golf. 82,000 rand. But there is no way you can afford this thing. Don't worry about affording it. You can reap having a phone you can't afford without having sown for it. Reap the phone first and sow after. Sow after. 24 months sowing for something you've reaped a long time ago. And you end up sowing more than what you actually have reaped. Now the thing increased it. No longer 24 months, there's also 36 months now. Because phones are becoming more expensive. So, reap the phone and sow after. But sow more than the value you are getting because you have reversed the law. And this is how we approach our finances on a regular basis. And we are losing so much. And don't tell me about using debt. I know this is how uh, billionaires use their money. Since we're not billionaires yet, let's not have that discussion. Because we like, yeah, but you can use debt. Uh -uh, That works for billionaires. I was going to break it down. It works for billionaires. If you're not a billionaire, don't play there. That works for billionaires. So this is how we do it. We reap and then we want to sow after. Because we are after immediate results. Seed time then harvest. We want it now. We, we Uber eat our food. We want it now. We want it now, now, now. You don't even want to take the time to get to know a girl. You just go to an app. Hook up with someone tonight. Everything so quick. So quick. Let us know our feet. Natav, come and join us. I want us to come give a seed. Ne? I've said a mouthful. I want us to come give a seed. You know, this is a prophetic conference and one of the things which launch us into the prophetic are colors. I'm seeing the color purple. I am seeing the color purple. Like, I'm sensing, I'm sensing the color purple. I'm just seeing the color purple, the color purple, purple. There are purple things I'm seeing. Purple. Purple, purple. This is the book of Matthew. Purple. The face of a lion. Purple, purple. Purple, purple. Purple, Lord, purple. Purple. They're going to give us a song. Um, if you've got your phone and want to give with your banking app, the banking details are there. Or you can just quickly scan the thingy behind your seat. And um, after you scan it, it will take you to a payment gateway. And you can freely give. Um, if you want to swipe or tap, Sister Toby is there. You know, you can swipe or tap. If you've got good old hard cash and you want to plant your seed, then you can come and plant your seed right now and I'm going to pray for it now. Amen. So they're going to give us a song and can you can all just come and, and sow into this conference. You know, and sow into this conference. Say, you know what, with this 200, I'm saying, get a bigger screen with this 200. You know, with this 200, I'm saying, yeah, you know, so um, can you just be a blessing in the Lord's house? You know, consider being sacrificial tonight. Consider being sacrificial. 500 nyana, 5,000 nyana. Consider being sacrificial. Consider being a blessing. You know, consider sowing into this conference. Amen. Can you give us a song? Lord, we will never say.
Can we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you that for as long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest shall remain. And Father, I pray, may you bountifully increase from whence we have taken. In the mighty name of Jesus, we just speak a blessing over the finances of your people as they partner with us for this conference. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Like, I just saw so many people coming in. Ogare, I can do offering again. <laughs> Listen, the Lord is still with you. Listen, uh, I sense of volume two. I sense of volume two. Uh, no, I can't let such a moment pass. Hallelujah, my God. <laughs> uh, I'm just playing. Um, we are going to go into the word of God. Um, I've taken a bit longer than I should have. Um, but there is sufficient time. There is sufficient time for the word tonight. Um, Natal will just be leading us into worship. And um, tonight will be graced by the ministry of Prophet Sean. And an awesome man of God. Uh, a prophet to the nations. Um uh, let our hearts be receptive tonight. Let our hearts be receptive. Let there be an expectation to receive from the Lord whatever he has deposited in his servant tonight. Whether it be a prophecy, whether it be a teaching, whether it be a prophetic instruction, let us receive a prophetic reward tonight. Um... Uh, let us have eagerness and anticipation, you know, to hear from God. You know, sometimes in an information generation, we don't have that purposefulness to hear God when we are being taught the word. I always say to the church that what is taught on Sunday even informs your prayer language during the week. You have a lot to pray about simply because of what you heard being taught. There's a promise to believe. There is something to leave behind. You know, there's repentance which needs to happen. Let us, let us be so expectant to receive from God. And our time is going to lead us in worship and when the man of God is he's ready um, you can come after when you are ready they're going to lead us in song Jeremiah says your words were found and I did eat them that's what Jeremiah says he says your words were found and I ate them you can also I appreciate the presence of Pastor Nezon Sobekwa and his lovely wife. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Wonderful men of God. Um, they're going to lead us in worship. And um, they're not going to perform again. They are leading us in worship. Let us lift up our holy hands everywhere. You know, let us lift up our voices. Let us be joined together in corporate worship. And uh, when the man of God is ready, um, the stage will be yours.
Se serve em si, se moia. 
Father, we glorify your name. We extol your name and give unto you the glory. All the praise, all the honor be unto you, our King. King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the name of say thank you to Saru, his wife Emmy, the leadership of this house, the oversight over this ministry, Pastor Cabello. Thank you for having me here in your midst. 
It is the first time I'm traveling in six years. In 2018, the Lord shut me down. Said, I want, to, I want you to stop traveling. And since that time, I've been traveling for over 20 years. It was very strange that God said to me, stop. Study the Passover. For a Passover is coming that will have worldwide consequences. 2018 was a very significant year in my own life. And me being here in Pretoria is also very significant. Currently, I am giving oversight to what I call a prophetic activation group. And they have been in intercession for this event for a long time. And it was during this six years that the Lord has strategically broken into my heart in a brand new way. I had to shed off dimensions of the prophetic particularly that has been learned over 20 years and more. And the Lord has got ways in which he deals with us. And uh, this being here with you is more than just me coming to this house. As I've been seeking the Lord spoke to me very clearly and said, and, and, and uh, many prophetic words that I will speak over the, this weekend has been related by this team that I have been building over the past couple of years. People from all nations, which was very strange because I never ever wanted to have a team of people around me because for 20 years I've been traveling alone. Wherever God took me, it was just me. And then the Lord began to change the ethos, the way things had to be done. But for 20 years I also had to sit under apostolic guidance and apostolic directives so that we can effectively learn how to change the architecture of the prophetic in an apostolic season. And that's what I have come to bring to you this weekend, primarily writing a book on this currently. There's a lot of papers here and this is all from <laughs> my notes. I make a lot of notes as I hear God. And I know that this place is charged with more than just the expectation of a people. But there's an expectation in the realm of spirit that I want to unfold to you tonight. One of the people in this prophetic group sent me this message today. And I want to just read it to you before I do anything. These people call me Papa Sean. <laughs> I don't actually want to be called that, I'm just Sean. But because of our relationships over the years, this is how they are referring to me. And I want to read what this one particular lady from Velcom, Mpo, has written. Dearest Papa Sean, in my time of prayer today, I sensed Father speaking to me about Pretoria. Why your first assignment post-COVID had to be in Pretoria? As I googled Pretoria, I felt like Father was saying that since Pretoria is South Africa's administrative capital, serving as the seat of the executive branch of government, and as the host of all foreign embassies to South Africa, this is where the trumpet needs to be sounded first. This conference is not so much just about this that I have been invited to, but it's bigger than just this 
conference. This is for South Africa and the nations. Divine decrees released over this weekend will be activated not only in Living Oracle's tabernacle, but throughout our nation and every foreign nation represented in the embassies in Pretoria. Papa Sean, this is a massive interruption. I see an eruption of true prophets and apostles. Sons of God that have been hidden will now begin to come on the scene with such humility, love for the word of God and for the brethren and honor of the Father. These will not seek to build a name for themselves. These are the ones standing on Mount Zion with a lamb, having his name and the name of the Father written on their foreheads. These are the ones ready to follow the lamb wherever it goes. They have set their face like a flint and they will not be moved nor intimidated. This is a company of people Father is activating through this conference. I want to read you a verse of scripture just before I start. There's so much in my spirit that I'm carrying to you after six years of waiting, waiting. And during the six years, God has beaten the hell out of me. I really mean it. Every wrong attitude, every wrong understanding, every imperative that flowed out of my own heart that has not been given by him, I had to delete. In fact, I will share a little bit of my testimony tomorrow or on Sunday. The Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to take all the ministry material that you have amassed over a period of nearly 30 years where you have traveled, whatever you have done, forget about it. Put it in boxes and shut it away, never to consult it again. All you can do with it is to write manuals and books, but you cannot preach from it. I will give you a brand new set of understandings that will not be sermonizing, but it will be the speakings of the Lord. So I believe, Pastor Cabello, that God is busy reorienting us, specifically in South Africa, into a different season. At the base of that season, at the initiation of it, there is a new Passover. The agricultural identity of natural Israel was cemented in seven feasts. And these seven feasts had a cycle. And it started with Passover and ended with tabernacles. And we know in between there are other feasts and I don't want to talk about that tonight. But I don't know why Passover is so important. Passover is the feast of closure of a previous season. But it's also the opening up of a brand new season as the people make ready to shift out of Egypt. Every time a God speaks within a particular season of something brand new, that, uh, and that particular season has run its course, and the people don't hear the sound of the brand new season. Now I believe that I'm coming in proclamation of something brand new. That the very things that we have feasted on will become Egypt. It will become the land of our oppression when we don't ship out with God in the right season and time. It's like this. If you go read Exodus 1, you'll see that a new king arose that did not know 
Joseph. Prior to this new king, Egypt was like heaven and Joseph a type of Christ that brought them resource and even brought his father out of famine to come and receive something brand new. But when a new king arose, the, the word king there would literally mean that a new dynasty has come to power. A new governmental order is now in, in procession that did not know about Joseph. Joseph immediately fell into disfavor. Or we can say that the national sentiment toward Joseph has automatically shifted so that the favor that once was on Joseph has now gone. And that brought the entire company of people into bondage. And from that day onward, Egypt was classified as a place of bondage, a place of slavery, a place in which the identity of a people got distorted by a pharaoh that didn't understand prophetic purpose. Every time a people do not shift with God in a particular kairos to the next phase in the journey, the previous place becomes our Egypt. It becomes the place of our bondage. We might have our conferences, we might preach, travel the nations, but we are no longer on the radar of the throne. We build things out of the fleshly orientation, not understanding that the kairos has changed. Guys, I sense him here. So I want to read you a scripture before I start. Are you ready? Are you ready to go home tomorrow morning? <laughs> I've got a lot of notes. Don't worry about it. It's just the way I do things. But I want to read a scripture out of Genesis quickly. 49 verses 1 and 2. Jacob is at the end of his tenure of life and he's calling his sons that would later become the progenitors of the 12 tribes that would form the nation. The man is old, but he's a patriarch with divine wisdom. So he calls his sons. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so that I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. I want to read it out of the New King James Version says, and God called his sons, sorry, Jacob called his sons and said, gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. This is a patriarchal moment in which instruction is going to flow upon 12 boys that has been sired by this man that would later on become the tribes and they will form the holy nation. What I want you to see, the word gather, he, he gathers them. It's like bringing them to a place of a summit where he's about to speak to them and reveal to every son their prophetic identity that they will craft upon the tribes that will become the nation. I want to show you how the prophetic identity of God is now changing in an apostolic landscape. The book that I'm busy writing has got to do with the new architecture of the prophetic in an apostolic season. And you will hear a few of those thoughts over this weekend that God has given me over a period now of six years that he had me hidden 
in my cave like Elijah. So I'm emerging out of the cave like Elijah after Elijah was threatened by Jezebel. He went into his cave of oppression and depression and gloom and doom. But he arose and came forth. And the first thing that he did, remember, he now emerged as a father. He used to be a single prophet that individually ran through the land and even came to the conclusion that I'm the only one. And I've been receiving a death threat from Jezebel. And I've run after my greatest accomplishment on Mount Carmel. And I ran, but he misinterpreted God. Because there were 7,000 that did not at that moment bow the knee to Baal. And he thought he was the only prophet left. But having been reoriented in his cave, he came out with a patriarchal understanding that now I'm no longer running alone. But I want to formulate, formulate not just a company of prophets, but I want to bring forth the sons of the prophets. In other words, I want to establish my fathering grace upon sons in the prophetic that will become a family of prophetic people and a community that I can generationally transfer what Father has given me into a successive generation of sons. And so Jacob is calling his sons and he is going to direct the prophetic gene pool of every son for the generations to come. In actual fact, every tribal allotment based on the naming of each son will now be prophetically configured so that every tribe will find its identification by the words given to a tribal father. So that they don't now receive personal words of prophecy anymore. But they become the signposts of what was given by God through a patriarchal father to their fathers. And they find expression in what their, what their own spiritual fathers carry within their genes as the prophetic seed. So I want you to see how God is going to change the prophetic, and I want to talk about that tonight. And so, Jacob was actually giving identity to the tribes through the prophetic decrees upon his sons for successive generations until the nation came forth. In the fourth generation, the nation came forth. And so, many times when prophetic agencies come into local houses like this, all of us want a word. But that's charismatic. Now, I'm not going to attack the charismatic because I used to operate like that. But God is changing the season. Now, every time Time a season changes. The gift doesn't change, but the administration of the gift changes. In keeping with a new season, a new kairos. Now, if you function in the new season from an old mentality and methodology, then you haven't been crafted to understand how to administrate or steward the gift within the unfolding seasons of God. Our God is not stationary. Our God maneuvers through seasons. Amen? Amen. Now, we are in an apostolic season, which I want to identify tonight. You have an apostle in the house. And before I do that, I've got two words I want to release. 
And uh, I think it's imperative that I do so tonight while we are here. It's fine. Let's leave this. I have a word for, what's the, what's the apostle's name there next to Cabello? Okay. I don't, know, I don't know why God is doing this, but it's almost like he's recognizing headship within the corporate gathering of this house first. So here are the words. I've got a word here that I wrote down while everything was going on. The Lord gave me a word. Uh, that I want to just share with you. So, what's the apostle's name? Muzi, Apostle Muzi. I just wrote the apostle that sits next to me. (laughs) It says here, a man of humble disposition, yet roaring in spirit and truth, Highly relational. Father is opening a door that seemed to be hard to open. He has given you the key of David. You will have access to an anointing that will establish you in a kingly disposition of art. There is a new paradigm of thought into which the spirit will lead you. He will teach you the protocols of the courts of heaven. A dimension in which you will have greater proximity to the throne. There will be a new unfolding of grace to access doctrine doctrine differently. Increase is coming, increase of hunger for the Logos. The Lord calls you into a time of waiting at his doors to receive a brand new way in which he will speak to you and through you and a new way of dispensing of his grace within you. That's a word from the Lord for you. Pastor Cabello, favor, unprecedented favor is being fashioned for you. You are compliant with these demands within a changing season, says God. A totally new group of relationships will be added to you, says the Lord. I hear Nigeria and nations of south and east. The Lord gives you what you need to enable you to broaden his purpose within your life and ministry. A training facility will be constructed through which pure doctrine will be dispensed to a general, new generation of young men and women. Your life is inundated with ministry activity, but Father desire you to come into closer proximity of his throne. Like Nehemiah, you will now be cupbearer to the king. You will not just taste the wine but watch over its purity before it's dispensed to the nations. Yes, you will watch over the purity of of my doctrine, the doctrine of Christ. You will make sure that it remains untainted from the distortions of Babylon. You You have been called to serve the wine, meaning the principles and the precepts and the ideology of the throne, to a hidden generation that now will come forth out of hiddenness. There awaits for you new arenas of functionality within this nation, South Africa. You will begin to operate in consult- consultative representation of the throne. Even those from, political, from the political fraternity will consult with you. Just come away, son, for new instructions await you. I don't just speak. I'm very careful what I say. But I believe it was very important that God singled the two of you out tonight. Not for any reason. But because the protocol of the kingdom must be adhered to in events like this. Cyril, the Lord will speak to you Sunday morning. (laughs) the word is already received okay for you, your wife, your house 
you will find <laughs> you will find that I operate very differently because the Lord has been tempering me now differently, and I find a lot of uh, resistance in the way that I administrate the office now. But I believe that this is a different season, a different time. Now, as I said, that when the kairos change, you know, you know what kairos means, an opportune season, but it comes with constituted events, the events of the throne to make us relevant. Many people think that relevance has got to do with how you externally change the structure of your ministry. Get new carpets, get new TV screens, get all the external things <laughs> that will attract the of God. It's, the Bible says that the, that the king governs by decree. So our God is a king and you have seen correctly the color purple. Yes, because the Lord said to me, go and unfold to them the kingly office in which they need to stand right now. This house, this house. But I want to show you, before you can operate in a subjective, experiential way in kingship, there are certain conditions that we need to uphold. Even though judicially, legally, we are kings in the order of Melchizedek. All of us are kings and priests. But that judicial fact of our kingship must become experiential in our lives. And the experiential, personal unfolding of your kingship carries certain conditions that I want to talk to you about in the course of this conference. So where do we start tonight? <laughs> There's so much on my plate, Pastor Cabello. And my voice has not been heard for six years from platforms. I can remember he called me about a year ago, is that so? And we had some Zoom together and I said to him, you know what, I operate different. I'd like to first know who you are, who's your wife, who's your children? Let us start there, you know, just who, who are you? And I want you to know who I am. And I said to him, don't call me prophet, don't call me apostle, just call me Sean. That's who I am. And uh, it took another year before the Lord said, yes, go now. But I know, Cyril, that this place is just a platform from which God wants to engage the heavens over Pretoria. Something drastically is going to change in Pretoria. There will be some ministries that God will shut down that are inaccurate. And there will be people running from these ministries because declarations will come forth from this house tonight and in the course of this week that's going to change the spiritual landscape over this territory. So we are coming into a jurisdiction. When we talk about territorial, ter territorial advance or territoriality gives you the way to govern. You can't govern without being territorial. Territoriality has got to do with the possession of land of land. Now, both land in the spirit and land in the natural. And I know that God will give this house new premises. That's what he said. So a decree is coming forth from the throne tonight. I'm just a mouthpiece standing here together with you making this declaration that something brand new is about to burst forth in the atmosphere of Pretoria. I'm not just coming to tickle ears and give you nice messages. I'm here sent by God. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come. I know God has sent me to come here. And that 
the trumpet must be blown in this territory. And the trumpet has got nothing to do with this thing that we physically blow. The word for blow is taqwa, which means that the one that operates the trumpet. Remember in Isaiah 58, now I'm just speaking, right? This is how God speaks. God doesn't speak in a sermon form. God just speaks. So I'm hearing, and as I'm hearing, I'm speaking. I've got notes. We will consult the notes. But let's hear what God is saying. Isaiah 58, 1. Isaiah 58, 1. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Revelation 1, 10. And I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet saying, so every time we talk about the trump of God, remember in, in the book of Numbers also, when they had to make two silver trumpets? Two is the number of, come on, you know, witness, testimony, and agreement. Two trumpets out of gold. Gold, the divinity. But gold has also got to do with the trumpeting forth. But remember, it wasn't gold trumpets. They were silver trumpets. Two silver trumpets. And those two silver trumpets, apostle and prophet. Jesus Christ, the head, and the multiplicity of the body of Christ. Two trumpets. One is in heaven, one is on earth. But preceding that synchronization between heaven and earth, God must bring forth apostolic and prophetic people that can relate these things to the body. So that the kingly office of the majesty of Melchizedek can come forth in the body of Christ. So the trumpeting forth of the declarations of God, which is the rulership dimension of God, as God begins to declare and release law, law will be released tonight. So when the kairos is completed, is come to fullness, a new season has come to fullness. God makes a declaration, a new sound, a new trumpeting forth of the law relevant to the kairos. Now, remember there's a scripture that says, I think it's in Hebrews 7, 12 or 12, 7. Just help me. It says that when the law changes, then the priesthood changes. Or you can put it the other way around. When the priesthood changes, then the law changes. What law? Not the law of Moses, but the law relevant to a new kairos that brings new speakings from the throne of God. Okay. You can just put it there. It's fine. So when the law changes, it, it demands that there be a new priesthood in the earth that can vibrate on the frequency of the new law as it exists in the mind of God. And when we behave in line with what the law, the constituted events that is dictated by the one in the throne is pulsating through our lives, now we become relevant, not with the environment in which we find ourselves, but we become relevant with the throne. God is seeking for people, Cabello, that can come in divine synchronization with heaven and can step into a new frequency in the earth. A people that understands how the one that sits upon the throne operates in a particular season. Our relevance has got nothing to do with external factors of our environment or I call it contextual reality. Some people study the context to understand what God is doing. No, that's a Babylonian way of understanding. Because anything that Babylon builds is built from the bottom up. Everything that comes from God comes from heaven down. That's why Revelation says that the new Jerusalem is coming out from God, out of heaven. People want to go to heaven, but God wants to come down into heaven. 
So, we, so God is needing a people, a priesthood, a new priesthood that can vibrate on the law that is pulsating on his heart. A people that can effectively take the law, become it, incarnate it, and begin to live it in the earth in a practical way. Pharisees of a new season are those that say and do not do. They have a truth structure. They even have the right doctrine. They sound correct, but there is no practical outflow of what they know in their lives. They carry about all the knowledge, but the knowledge that they have cannot change them inherently. So we can no longer prophesy out from that domain where we speak an accurate word to others, but the very same words haven't changed us. So I want you to understand where we're going here tonight. I'm not speaking just to you. I'm also addressing some stuff in the spirit over this place. Because church is not a set of services. Church is a position that we come into. So that God can set you up as a lampstand in the territory. So that your, your coming together is the pulsating of a new frequency into the territory. Every time you meet the lampstand, the shining forth, the principles of the throne currently in the heart of God. And now we speak forth. Remember what Jesus said to the one church at Ephesus? Can you remember? What, was the, what, what, what did Jesus say to this church? He was walking amongst the seven. He's the one walking amongst the seven golden candlesticks. And then he said, I commend you for this and I commend you for that. I commend, but I've got this one thing against you. What was that one thing? You've lost your first love. First love there is not the fact of our infatuation with Jesus when we met him the first time. First love has got to do with first things that were built into the structure of your church and into your lives that has now got lost because you allowed others without understanding the blueprints and the designs of the heaven to build upon you. So it corrupted the way that you perceive the things heavenly. And I've got that against you, says the Lord. Unless you repent, I will remove your what? Your lamp stand. And remember the lamp stand depicts symbolically the church. How is the church removed? Some people don't even know that they've been removed. But they're still functioning. Come, let me take you to a scripture. Let's quickly go to Hebrews. Guys, I'm just speaking tonight. Is it okay? Okay. Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews, I think. It's chapter 12. Let's go from, I think, verse... Let's read from verse, let me see, where can I go to now? Verse 18, verse 18, quickly. For you have not come, may I take my jacket off, is it fine? For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burnt with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest. Now remember, the book of Hebrews is a book of comparison. It compares two systems. Now here it's speaking about two mountains. He speaks, when he says, you've not come to a mountain that may be touched, he speaks about Mount Sinai. And he's comparing Sinai with Mount Zion. So he says, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned 
or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now, this is the change over. But, say but. but. You have come. Say I have come. I am not on my own route there. I've already come. Say, I've already come. come. I have come to Mount Zion. You know, many people like to put the things into the future. They postpone things. In John 4, remember what Jesus said? In verse 34, do you not say four months more? And then the harvest? In other words, who was he speaking to? His, his own disciples that became his apostles. They misinterpreted that Jesus didn't understand. It is that same verses where he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then he says, do you not say four months more? They might not have said it, but he discerned that they wanted to say it. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? But I say to you, lift up your eyes, and see the fields are already white unto harvest. Do you not say, say, let go? Do you not build an opinion intellectually with your words that goes against my opinion? You are opinionated with intelligible words of men's wisdom. You, you lift up your gaze and say, four months more. In other words, you operate in postponement. If he says four months more and then the harvest, what is harvest? What feast? Tabernacles. If he says four months more, where were they standing? What was the plateau out of which they saw? Pentecost. Four months more. But Jesus was already where? He was in tabernacles. And so he was dragging them along through sight. Through prophetic sight. Drag the church along to see where God is currently positioned. Most of the church can't see like the man in John chapter 9, born blind. Blind from birth. They have need of washing their eyes in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation means saint. In other words, they need to wash in the pool of the saint one. The pool of the apostolic. And they need to wash continually and keep on washing until sight returns. The whole issue of the prophetic is the return of sight to the church. So that they can see the way Jesus sees. And that's why we are here tonight. So let's just read, read further here. Come on, I'm saying a whole lot of stuff. Not planned, it's just our Lord leads. But verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Where have you come to? In which city are you a citizen of? Come on. Your, do you know that your citizenship is not on the earth but in heaven? That when we are waiting from there a savior so that these vile bodies might put on his glorious body. Say, I have citizenship. Not of South Africa. But citizenship of another kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. That kingdom we are coming to reveal to you. That you are a citizen of. If you still identify you according to the lines of culture. And the lines of race and ethnicity. Then you are not yet in the kingdom because the cultural identification of who you are and who I am has been wiped out by the cross of Jesus so in Christ there can be no more male nor female nor black nor white nor Indian nor colored because in Christ we are all one come on guys why is it getting so quiet your heritage has been lifted into the genealogy of Christ. Because you are of Christ. You are in fact the body of Christ. The Bible never says the church is the body of Jesus. The Bible says the church is the body of Christ. In fact, Christ has never left the earth. 
Christ has always been on the earth. Because you are the body. There's another scripture that says, you are the body of his flesh and bones. In other words, nothing can happen in the realm of the earth until the church comes into a compliant state. Because we are the body of Christ. Don't look at the external environment within which you find yourself. And the, and, the, and the issues that are temporal, the temporalities of life that presses against you. Don't look at contextual factors that dictates to you to, to operate and behave in a certain way. No, you are not of the earth. You are from a different order. You have come from heaven and you have an earthly experience and you are making everything brand new wherever you go. I'm a species from another realm. I've been born from above. I'm born again. You cannot even see the kingdom unless you are born out of water and blood. Come on, guys. Yes, you live in Pretoria. Yes, you are a South African after the natural orientation of our flesh. But in the spirit, we are all alike. The culture of deity is what we live out from. In God, there's no competition but recognition. You don't find in God where the Father squeals with the Son and the Holy Spirit is at loggerheads with the, with the Father. There is no competition but recognition of divine persons. Go equal. There's a distinction because of function. Only for, for the purpose of function is the distinction. Right? So, when, when, when I say there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a distinction, they go equal as persons. But there's difference for the purpose of function. Only for function. And function brings a ranking within the Godhead. So whatever you see in God is what must be built reflexively upon the earth. If there is in God Father, there must be fathers on earth. If there is in God Son, there must be sons on earth. If there is no competition in God, there must be no competition on the earth. If there is equality of divine persons in God, there must be an equality of the sonship identity of the sons of God in the earth. The only reason why there is difference is because God gave grace to build the body. And even the first ness of an apostle, according to 1 Corinthians 12, has got nothing to do with being better. First just simply means for function. For functionality, apostles are first. Come, let's go here. I, wanna, I want us to read this quickly because I want to make a statement here. Just a statement. Maybe tomorrow we might be more structured. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable com company of angels. So in your company, there are angels. If God can open your eyes, you will see them here. The problem with the church is that we are so blind that we haven't got discernment. Many times Jesus walks into our ministries like he did in Revelation, he's the one that walks amongst the seven gold. You know, you can't tell Jesus when to come and not to come. He's the inspector of his house. He comes to see whether everything is built according to design. And he is the man with the measuring rod. He comes to measure the standards of reality within the house. He measures our womanhood. He measures our manhood. He measures our marriages. He measures our giving. He, me he measures everything about us. To see whether it lines up with the measuring standard of perpendicularity with the throne. 
And if he finds it wanting, he says, repent. For you have lost now your first love. So I want you to, to be very discerning as I speak. You must discern his person and his presence and the angels. You see, we must create awareness that becomes heavy inside of us of his nearness. Of his nearness. Many people don't understand that nearness. But when you become aware of his nearness, do you know what? Sanctification will be instantaneous. Just the awareness of him being with me will cause me to pull my marriage straight. Will cause me to bring my finances into alignment will cause me never to be at loggerheads and contradicting him. He is the lawgiver on the throne, but the law keeper in your heart. He gives the law, keeps it in your heart. By his agent, the Holy Spirit. So your heart defines who you really are. Man looks on the, on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God does not classify you by race or culture or creed or ethnicity. He is no longer doing that. Now that you are in Christ, you are a new creation man that never previously existed. Some brand new. Come on, some brand new. My natural orientation after my flesh. Say it. My natural orientation after my flesh. Do not count. Do not count. In, the spirit. In the spirit. We are all one. That's why I do believe, Cabello. I don't know. I do believe that God can use women. He can. Because in the spirit, in Christ, there's no more male, nor female. We have cut ourselves off from potential by not allowing women to operate functionally under apostolic oversight. We castrated ourselves. But I'm here to come and make a declaration, ladies. God wants you to rise up in your strength. Under governmental authority, submit your functional anointing to the apostolic oversight over you. Then you can function as long as you submit yourself to apostolic oversight. It is when you op choose not to operate under apostolic government that the order of Jezebel is released. Okay. Let's just see. Let's see. And maybe in one of the sessions speak on Jezebel. Guys, you must tell me how much time I've got. You come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Now, this is what I want you to see. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they, if they, referring back now to the day of Moses at Mount Sinai, if they did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Now, listen. 
whose voice then shook the earth, whose voice then, Mount Sinai, shook the earth. But now at Mount Zion, he has promised, saying, yet once more, shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Now, he clarifies what the words yet once more means. Listen, he says, now this, yet once more, indicates something. What does it indicate? The removal of those things that are being shaken, of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken will remain. Yet once more, this yet once more, speaks of things that can be shaken. So that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Now, this is the word I want you to see, removal. Remember I told you God is about to remove some churches from off his radar. It will only be a blip. The icon, the icon that reflects your identity on the heavenly computer is missing. Why would God do that? Because the Lord has given during COVID two years for us to reorientate toward this Kairos that is now to unfold Cabello. There's a new Kairos on the horizon. I told that to Apostle Farmer. I said, he's, he's now in Trinidad. I said, he, I phoned me. Normally phones me. Sean, what's on the radar? Because we pray governmentally over this apostolic team wherever they go to make sure that we blast the territories before apostles arrive. That no territorial devil has got the right to infringe upon their movements in that foreign territory. That's part of what the prophets do. That's why I have established a governmental prayer school where I train people how to pray. It's not a prayer meeting. It's a prayer school where you come to learn how to governmentally decree, how to release the law of God in a particular season over the territories of the earth. Governmental prayer has got nothing to do with praying for myself. It's kingdom-oriented prayer that you pray away from yourself. You serve the will and the purposes of God in governmental prayer. In that prayer school, we never pray for ourselves. But if you don't understand the prophetic posture of where God has got the church, you will not be able to pray correctly either. So let's look at this quickly. How much time I have, Pastor? Pastor? Fifteen minutes, okay. He says, listen to this, he says, he will shake the heavens and the earth. Where do you find these words? In the book of Haggai, right? Out of Haggai. He quotes out of Haggai. Now he says, yet once more, he talks about his voice, then shook the earth. In other words, the voice. Remember, the prophetic has got to do with actualizing the voice. Interprets the voice that releases the mind of God. The prophetic has got to do with understanding the voice of God. Now, the voice is not just the speech of God audibly into your ears. But there are variations in which God's voice comes to a people. The highest frequency of detecting the voice is the office of the prophet. But God gives lower dimensions and frequencies. In the prophetic frequency, there are levels of speech. And not everybody can hear God on the same level when God begins to speak. God always seems to speak governmentally through the office of the prophet. But the basic understanding of prophecy, as we find it in 1 Corinthians 14, 
verses 1 to 3 has got to do with three fundamental things. Name them for me. You know that. Edification, comfort, and exhortation. Those three fundamental things must always be in any prophetic speech, whether it's on the highest frequency or the lowest frequency. Right? So the office of the prophet, he brings those dimensions but in a different way than the ordinary believer. So he says here, we mustn't turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now has promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. What is the means by which God is shaking? By the employment of his voice. Come on, I want you to see that. He says, in the previous season, through his voice, he shook an external mountain. But yet once more, he will shake again things. But where? It will be a multidimensional shaking that is currently going on in the earth. Economics are being shaken. Political arenas are being shaken. Everything is shaken in the earth right now. In fact, there's fracture. There is disagreements. There's a whole lot of stuff. But if you don't discern the work of God behind the external manifestation, then you're going to be led astray. It's like in the day of Elijah when he came to King Ahab. He told him, at my word, there will be no rain nor dew in this land for three and a half years. The uninformed church will arrange for a prayer meeting in the stadium to pray for rain. And that means that they will work in contradiction to the will of God. Because they misinterpret what God was doing for the life of the prophet. So I'm saying that there's an unseen, invisible architecture behind the speakings of God. So we don't look at the things seen, but the things unseen. For the things seen are temporal, but the things unseen are eternal. The eternal reality is what we are after. And that is what drives the office of the prophetic. We want to bring what is, what is unseen and invisible out of the throne, out of the heart of God and make it clear to people by interpreting God's mind, speaking it through our voices. We got that? Okay. I'm going to end with this because of time. Let's see tomorrow if we can touch the prophetic architecture. I couldn't get there. So I'm just speaking tonight, okay? I'm introducing myself to you. You don't know me. So this is me, okay? This is how God speaks through Sean. It seems incoherent. There's no structure to it. I know apostles are very structured in the way that they bring doctrine and that's how it's supposed to be. Because the apostle targets the mind to set in the mind a new order of identity, the mind of Christ, so that the thinking system can change. But the prophet targets the heart. We, are, we want to scratch in the deepest realities of your heart. This is the new covenant reality. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their forefathers. I will write my laws upon their minds and their hearts. How is God writing today? He's using two offices to write. Apostle, prophet. And that's how the foundation is laid in the mind and in the heart. So that the covenant is no longer on visible stone tablets, but the two tablets is the mind and the heart. So that the covenant is no longer visibly carried by a man called Moses. But a people have become the covenant. Because their minds and their hearts have been written upon by apostolic and prophetic ministry. And that's how the foundation called Christ is laid. Isn't that what apostles and prophets do? They lay a foundation. Ephesians 2. The church is built upon the 
foundation. That word is themelios. Themelios means a picture of, an, of a staircase. Staircase. The first step is themelios, is the foundation. In other words, if you want to have a regular ascending into the reality of the eternal and the unseen invisible world, you've got to step onto the first step. The melios. But the melios get laid in minds and hearts. It's the new crafting of God in the season. And only when you've allowed apostles and prophets to build reflexively into your mind and your heart can you ascend in regular rises into the eternality of Christ. You got that? Okay. I'm saying a whole lot of stuff here just to, just to provoke you. I don't want you to sleep tonight. I want you to hear my voice when you sleep. You can get up 3 o'clock in the morning and walk your, 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 your room and pray. Okay. As we close, verse 27. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. This is a multi-dimensional shaking. It's worldwide. God is shaking some stuff. Now, I'll ask you a question. What does the words once more mean to you? A repeated action. Isn't that so? Once more means God will do something that he did before. It's a repeated action. But once more indicates something. What does it indicate? It doesn't mean a repeated action in the Hebrew construct. It means that God is about to remove something. And the word removal is the word metathesis. Meta means to shift. And thesis means the principles that governs an act. Listen to me carefully. I don't want you to get distracted now. Just listen to me as we close here. Meta thesis, removal. I want to show you how God is about to remove some ministries in your city. That declaration has come tonight and we are enforcing it as law. God will shut down what is illegitimate in the spirit. Get yourselves ready for people coming to you, Cabello. Because God will scatter the sheep. Because of inaccurate houses. Pretoria is in for it. I believe God's about to do something in this city that you have been praying for years for. I sense that. What is illegitimate what has been set up fundamentally out of the intelligence of man, even though it might look big right now, will be shut down. And those that are truly called in this city will rise. So God is about to remove metathesis Meta to shift theses, the principles at once made an action legitimate. Let me explain it like this. In the night when Jesus was betrayed, that very same night, the priest stood and the whole of Israel were preparing lambs to be killed the next day on Passover. But the Passover lamb has also been prepared in the upper room. Court taken from pillar to post. King Agrippa, King Herod, Pontius Pilate. Just like the lamb in, in Exodus 12 was inspected to find any impurities. So in the night of his betrayal, God's lamb that John pointed out, behold the Lamb of God was also under scrutiny. The scrutiny of men coming from 
the religious fraternity coming from the political fraternity of Rome scrutinized God's lamb it was from the political fraternity that these words came forth I find no fault in him but the Pharisees cried crucify him and let his blood be upon our children and our children's children. They invoked the curse upon their generations. Not realizing what they were doing, they asked for the blood of that lamb. But it was in God's purpose to shed the blood of his lamb. So the next day when Jesus hung on the tree and God's lamb was bleeding for us. It invalidated an entire priesthood. The entire Levitical priesthood was shut down by one act. The act of God killing his lamb. Every time our God wants to fight a battle, he needs a lamb with which to wage war. Yet, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He opened all his mouth. As the sheep is dumb before her shearers, so he opened all his mouth. And when you look at this lamb in Isaiah 53, there was no comeliness in him, no beauty. That we should desire him. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. God once again want a lamb company to arise in the earth. The only way that this earth will shift and turn is when there is a people that again will not count their lives like Revelation says. They did not love their lives unto the death. Are you part of that company? A lamb company? A lamb is innocent. No impure motives. Defenseless. A lamb has got no defense systems. A lamb is not argumentative. The purest of earthly animals upon which the dove symbolically came to sit. In other words, the nature of the lamb in an apostolic company is what attracts the Spirit of God more and more and more. So God needs that company, remember, that stands with the lamb on Mount Zion. Remember we talk about Mount Zion here? That you have come to? So in Revelation 14, he says that there's 144,000, which is a multiple of 12s that speaks about the governmental family of God, compounded together, standing with the Lamb, a company that has been built apostolically correct, a people with an apostolic mindset and an apostolic outlook in life, that understand the dimensions of the doctrine of Christ, that they've been sculptured with a lamb company, having in their foreheads the name of the Father and the Son. In other words, this company has been coded with fathering and sonship dynamics. In other words, within the psyche of such a people, their Thought life has been taken over by, by the dimensions of the fathering grace and nature of God and imprinted with the sonship identity of the Son. You are that people. So in this night when that lamb was killed, sorry that the next day when he was killed on, on Golgotha, a whole leadership structure was invalidated and 
now there was a change over to the eternal priesthood of Melchizedek. Years before the progenitor of Jesus. Remember in Galatians says that the promises were made unto Abraham and his seed. Not many seeds, but one seed who is Christ. The seed of Abraham is Christ. Then in verse 28 of Galatians chapter 3, if you then belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. In other words, He is the seed of Abraham and we also are the seed of Abraham. Him as the head and we as the many members of his body. One new man that has been built by God in the regions of the earth. We are Abraham's seed. If you go right back to Genesis 14, when Abraham met Melchizedek for the very first time, what did Abraham do? He bent his knee and brought a tithe to Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed him and he said, Blessed be thou, Abraham of God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. Every time you find Melchizedek, you see the interconnection and the synchronization of two dimensions of life, heaven and earth, king and priest. The kingly operates within the Babylonian context of life. The priestly ethos has got to do with searching and wanting him in a temple. We get our instructions through the priestly dimension that we can live successfully as kings Monday through to Sunday in this current earth. So, the night when Jesus was betrayed, what did Melchizedek give Abraham? He served him with bread and wine. What did Jesus serve his twelve with? Bread and wine. Jesus was actually saying, I am that Melchizedek that came from the loins of my father Abraham. I'm the fulfillment of the order of Melchizedek. And tomorrow when I die on that cross, I'm about to invalidate, make redundant a whole order of priests from the tribe of Levi. And me dying is the installation of the eternal priesthood that we have been lifted into. That day, your genealogical, your genealogical records got wiped out after the flesh and the orientation of your biology. Yes, you will always remain somebody living in Pretoria, right? But in the spirit, you, your whole lineage has been lifted into the lineage of Christ. So you are a species that never ever previously existed. You are different. Now I want to say that to end with this. How is God invalidating ministry? All that he does, he shifts the, he shifts the principles that once made an action legitimate in the mind of God, he shifts it. He takes the principles that never changes, that are eternal, and he just puts them into another wine skin. Huh? So that it can contain the what? The new wine of the new Kairos. So I'm declaring to you there's a new Kairos. I'm going to talk to you about that tomorrow. There's a new Kairos on the horizon that God is about to shift. It is a fundamental shift out of outer court, holy place, beyond the veil of your own flesh. It's the place where the Ark of the Covenant is. 
there where covenant becomes the only reality that God wants. That day when he died, the whole priesthood of Levi was invalid. If any priest after Jesus died, still the next day offered a lamb to God for the sins of the people, God will no longer respond. To your sacrifice that you bring because your priesthood has been invalidated because God shifted the principles out from Levi into Melchizedek. So God is shifting the thesis again. He's changing the order of things in the earth. If anyone is not yet apostolic, who has not yet come into an apostolic dimension, you are already removed. You just don't know it yet. You can have church, you sing along, you're happy, clappy hour. You can travel the nations, have many sons, but you no longer are registered in the throne. Not you, your ministry. Go look for me there if that church, Rose of Sharon, who's the pastor of Rose of Sharon? Master, we don't find him on the heavenly computer. That man is supposed to be a doctor. That man is supposed to be something else. Why is, what is he doing in that ministry? Well, in this season, we can't call ourselves. The callings must be of God. Come on, I want you to stand, 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 stand. Can we have that worship team just for a while, just for a while, just for a while. Let's lift our hands to Him. Shantara lama kete be shikatara lama baba ba Morolo mogo di de bere elementi da bara lama baba ba Shara lama baba ga de bere elementi da bara la monto Shetere le meke te masha reketi masha katara la Morolo mogo di da ba Yes God we make declaration over Pretoria that God this is a new day of arrival for this territory Install it Lord over this place because it's a new day of arrival that has come Lord for your church in this region in the name of Jesus Christ Father every illegitimate thing shut it down in the name of Jesus bring forth the reality of the apostolic in great splendor and great power in the name of Jesus let the force of the kingdom be felt within this territory as there will be a migration of God of people out of inaccurate places into what has been built accurately in this time and in this season in the name of Jesus pastor you can come okay. Lord we love you thank you Jesus
want to bless you tonight we want to give you glory and honor in the mighty name of Jesus Father God we bless you for for your servant Father God we bless you for such a word that you have uttered and spoken over us in the mighty name of Jesus Father God we thank you that you are depositing into us new things you are depositing heavenly things Father God our hearts are ready and we your people are expectant of what you are doing and Father we want to drink of the wine we want to partake of the wine. We want to imbibe of it, O oh Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father God, we just want to give you glory and honor. We just want to extol you this evening. We want to crown you as king in our midst. In the mighty name of Jesus, there is indeed none like you. In the mighty name of our risen Lord Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I appreciate the servant of the Lord one more time? Amen. The environment says a bit more. But we have come to the end. Uh, we have come to the end. Uh, I'm going to ask Murit uh, Ishmael to come and thank the Lord for us. But our MC can make whatever announcements he wants to make, if there are any. There are... Yeah, we continue tomorrow, Bazalani. Um, from me, there is nothing else more. Um, and I, I just like a 
this month just to bless the Lord uh, for us. Amen, Bazalai. Uh, just a quick announcement on my side. Um, let us have hands for Murute. Amen. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, this apostle again, prophetic things. Um, Bazalai, um, can we please... Um, um, a quick announcement on my side is that all those that need uh, transportation um, who, um, from here to town, can you please see Brother Temo? So he's waving his hand. Oh, well. um, yeah, uh, that was it from me, man of God. Until we meet again here again tomorrow or 10 o'clock sharp. Amen. Amen. One announcement. Ne? The prophetic school will not be live streamed. Ne? 